AI is artificial intelligence. That's all anyone wants to talk about. AI. 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 Right now is the time to harness the availability of AI. This is the greatest technology I have ever seen. A farm field can vanish in a month and return as a fortress of servers. Inside, GPUs drink power and water, and the heat never stops everywhere. That is the AI build-out happening now. But the old tricks are running out. Silicon can only switch so fast. Copper can only carry so much before it becomes lost and delayed. So the next leap will not come from bigger chips alone. It will come from new ways to connect chips, so millions act as one machine. Today, you'll see three key innovations shaping that blueprint and why light is taking over. The city-sized computer. AI data centers are no longer just bigger warehouses. A single next-generation AI campus can draw one to two gigawatts of power about what an entire city can use. In some regions, like Northern Virginia, data centers already consume a huge share of the grid, and new projects keep queuing up. Inside these sites, millions of GPUs crunch training data day and night. They also dump enormous heat into the building. Once that heat hits the room air, it has to be removed right away, or the chips will throttle. That is why a startling chunk of the facility's electricity does not run computation at all. It goes into cooling systems, pumps and chillers, humming non-stop in the background. Here is the twist. The real bottleneck is not just how much math the GPUs can do, it is how much data must move between them. Modern AI training spreads one job across thousands, then hundreds of thousands of processors. What used to be a room of computers starts behaving like one computer the size of a neighborhood. Meta's Hyperion project in Richland Parish, Louisiana, is often described as a computer the size of Manhattan. It is planned at a scale that feels unreal. An AI cluster aiming for multiple gigawatts, planned to scale to 5 gigawatts, with over a million GPUs acting as one giant supercomputer. When one workload spans a whole building, every tiny delay between racks becomes a choke point. The network stops being a simple connection, it becomes part of the computation. That is why the new gold rush in AI infrastructure is not only in chips, it is in the links between chips and the companies that sell those links. Copper hits its limit. For the last digital revolution, copper was the shovel. It was cheap, familiar, and easy to root. It sits on every board, between every chip, and across every rack. A hyperscale AI build can absorb tens of thousands of tons of copper as it fills halls with cables and backplanes. For years, that worked because data rates were modest and distances were forgiving. But AI pushes links into a different regime. At tens of gigabits per second, the distance copper can carry a clean signal, collapses from long runs to just a few meters. Push the rate higher and you end up with inches. The faster you try to drive the signal, the more it gets attenuated. It arrives weaker, noisier, and eventually useless. To keep copper alive, engineers add equalizers, amplifiers, and retimers. Each fix burns power and adds heat. Worse, the fixes stack. Suddenly, every extra centimeter costs energy, and every watt of link power becomes another watt that cooling must remove. This is why teams can double the number of processors and see almost no speed up. The GPUs sit idle, waiting for data, because the network is suffocating them. In a gold rush, the people who get rich are often the ones selling tools. In this rush, the tools are interconnected, and copper, the old tool, has taken us almost as far as it can go. What makes AI unique is that links behave like a second processor. Surdies, blocks, switches, and cables now decide whether the cluster trains fast or crawl. Future racks aim for hundreds of terabits per second of bisection bandwidth, so every wasted joule on a copper hop multiplies into megawatts at campus scale. If AI factories are going to scale toward racks that push hundreds of terabits per second, the industry needs a medium that does not punish you for speed and distance. That medium is light. The last two centimeters. Light plays by different rules. Photons do not fight electrical resistance, and sending more data does not automatically create more heat. 
That is why Optics already dominates long-distance links in every major data center. The strange part is where Optics is still missing, right next to the computer. Even now, there is often a short electrical hop between the GPU die and the optical engine that finally puts data onto fiber. Those few centimeters are where power, latency, and heat spike. Closing the gap sounds simple until you meet the physics. To turn data into light, you need a photonic modulator, a device that controls photons the way a transistor controls electrons. Classic modulators force ugly trade-offs. Mach Zender interferometers can be robust, but they are huge by chip standards. Micro ring modulators can be tiny, but they drift with temperature. A shift of about two degrees can knock a ring out of tune. Now put that next to a GPU package that can swing from roughly 30 degrees Celsius at idle to about 90 degrees Celsius under training load, sometimes within seconds. Thermal stability becomes the graveyard of many photonic ideas. That is why the industry talks about the last two centimeters. Over time, optics crept closer, from external cables to boards to co-packaged modules beside compute dies. The end game is an optical interposer, where light moves between chiplets the way copper traces do today. To get there, two things must survive inside the hot package. You need a small, fast modulator that stays stable, and you need a laser light source that can live in the same thermal chaos. For years, those were the missing pieces. IMEC, lasers on silicon, and silicon germanium. One group that refused to quit is IMEC, a semiconductor research hub in Belgium, where many companies test ideas long before they reach products. They kept running into a basic truth. Silicon is great for logic, but poor at making light. A good laser needs a material that emits photons efficiently, and gallium arsenide is one of the best. The catch is manufacturing. The silicon world runs on large 300 mm wafers. Gallium arsenide wafers are smaller and far more expensive, and the materials do not naturally match. For years, it looked like you had to choose one or the other. IMEC found a workaround by etching tiny V-shaped trenches into silicon and growing gallium arsenide inside those microscopic channels. The geometry helps trap defects before they spread, letting usable lasers form directly on silicon in a way that can scale. Then comes modulation. Even with a laser, you still need to encode data onto light right beside the hot computer. That search led to silicon germanium. Germanium responds strongly to electric fields and can handle temperature swings better than many tiny resonant designs. The obstacle was lattice mismatch, which creates stress, defects, and dark current. IMEC tuned growth and doping until the devices behaved, shrinking them while keeping stability. The payoff was modulators, shown around 440 gigabits per second per lane, with far less power than equivalent high-speed copper links. This is why the money is real. Celestial AI pushed germanium approaches and showed fast chiplet demos at hot chips. Shortly after, Marvel acquired Celestial AI for more than $3 billion. Whoever wins this race shapes the gateway that feeds future AI racks. Coupe, Passage, and the blueprint ahead. Not everyone is betting on the same photonic path. A major alternative is TSMC's Coupe, short for Compact Universal Photonic Engine. It bonds an electronic die, and a photonic die only micrometers apart. The electronic side drives modulators and reads photodetectors. The photonic side roots the light and sends it into the fiber. The whole stack turns electrical signals from a GPU into light, ships them, then turns them back into electrical signals on the other end. Shrink the handoff distance, and you cut latency and waste, opening the door to terabit class links with much lower power than today's pluggable optics. IR Labs has already shown a chip using coupe ideas, and big players are lining up because it offers a clean path to scale networks toward million GPU factories. Meanwhile, the germanium route still carries risk. The hardest part is reliability over time. If dark current rises or devices drift after years of stress, the whole bet fails. Light matter attacks the same problem from below the package. 
Its optical layer, Passage, sits under the processor and gives each chiplet a direct path into photonic waveguides. Data moves vertically out of each die, instead of waiting behind shared electrical exits. Light Matter has argued that while some systems talk about single-digit terabits, Passage targets far higher bandwidth, even up to 64 terabits, and can be 8 to 10 times faster in practice, while also pushing cost down. They often compare it to pluggable optics priced around 70 cents per gigabit per second, where integrated optics can be cheaper. Step back, and the story is clear. The next era of AI is less about one monster chip, and more about how fast thousands of chips can behave as one computer. In that world, optics becomes a continuation of Moore's law at the system level. Copper carried us to early AI. Light is what will carry us beyond it. If you remember one idea, make it this. The future of AI is an interconnected story. We can add more GPUs, but if the network chokes, the speed gain disappears. That is why lasers on silicon, tough new modulators, and optical layers inside packages matter so much. They turn a building of racks into one computer that stays busy. Over the next decade, watch who solves reliability and cost at scale, because they will sell the shovels. Until next time, stay curious and keep looking for the last two centimeters. Thanks for being here.